Good. I want to welcome this is Ken Boa to the um, webinar, Think on These Things. And I like that image because we are called to use our minds as well as our, our hearts. And it's a being, knowing, and doing process. So in this series we're doing, we're doing it on a, a series on the whole question of the uh, objections that people raise to Christianity. And we've been looking at a number of questions that have been surfacing all along. And the question about uh, whether uh, God exists and so forth has been one of the things we've looked at. And uh, let's just pick up where we left off on that. So in doing that, let me just get my little guy here. And then we have these questions, just to give you an orientation again of where we are. We're now really at the last of these components. Uh, can anyone be sure of his salvation? But we have three supplementary topics that will come up afterwards as well that are based upon these. It's kind of a follow-up on these themes. But the question before us tonight is um, the question, how can we be sure of our salvation? And this becomes uh, the whole motif, this this whole question of what's before us. Um, how can we understand um, the, um, it's really relating to the implication of these questions before us here. So it, what about good works? When we discover it's not by works, but by grace through faith, then the question is that not simply too easy. Isn't that too simple? And then we talked about what does it mean to believe? And we said it's more than intellectual assent, but actually personal reception. And then we relate now to this question, but what about assurance and how can we be confident uh, that we have that? So those are not logical questions that we can be sure of. And uh, so let's kind of plunge into that and give a quick overview of this objection. First of all, it's related to uh, people many times who've wrote, related to a culturally Christian setting that's taught salvation depending on rule keeping, and it's a very common uh, mo motif. And we argue that if getting into heaven depended on our good works as well as our faith in Christ, and none of us could have any confidence. So we're going to get to we'd never be sure that you did enough, that what proportion of your work. So we've explored all those questions before, and we've actually said that it's really it's not based upon our performance, but on his perfection and his uh, what his he has done on our behalf. So it becomes a very clear understanding that it's related to a relationship and it's not depending upon our, our performance. So given that, let's continue. The first option is that we can't be sure. So some will claim you just can't know it. And this is usually going to be a request for the clarification of the gospel that's necessary here. So essentially we're looking at is the need for us to grasp what is going on, uh, what what is the gospel, what's the nature of it. And people often assume that it's impossible because of the question of faith or sin or good works. So it's really not a question of uh, what we think, but what God's word says, because it's not a question of feelings, but of, of, of trusting in God's truth and remembering that feeling can be a good diagnostic tool, but it's not the thing that we use to guide our, our uh, understanding. So understanding that, then we move to this clarification of the gospel. What does it mean? So the question, one question is, can't um, a person stop believing? If it's by grace through faith, what happens when you don't have enough faith? And so we've talked about that. Again, the idea of maybe they've discarded their faith in college or something like that as a delusion. So the question that is before you there is, was it profession or possession? And many times what a person claimed that they had was not the real thing at all, as was certainly um, my, I was a good exemplar of that. So the question of also doubts comes in. And the if you, if you never ask this question, is all of this really true? That becomes a problem. So it's important for us to realize we're we're not so much um, questioning the thing as we are saying we need to make sure that if it's found, founded on fact and not on feeling, and that uh, there are good, good evidences for it. And I think it's wise for us to wrestle with those questions of, of doubt. And it's not a question of feeling, but it's a question of what is the truth? What's the gospel foundation? We've talked about that. And of course, it's built upon the authority of God's word and the, uh, the, the historicity, historicity of resurrection and many um, com convincing evidences that are, that are there that substantiate it. 
Um, the real issue is going to be John 10, 28 to 29. And we use this text because this is such a critical text. <clears throat> my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. So that if what you have been given then is, is the real gift, no one can snatch you out of the hands of the one who's called you into that relationship. It's a very critical text. Our hands are firmly in his grip. And so it comes down to the one who loved me, the one who pursued me, the one who wooed me. So it's not so much my attempt to know him, but his pursuit of me has become always this understanding. So it's uh, our hands are in his grip, and it's dependent upon his ability and not ours. Some people think then, if it's not a question of the um, not of faith, what about this question of sin? Aren't there some sins that can disqualify a person? And my, my point is here that God judges our hearts and thoughts, not just our actions. So Jesus uh, tells us then you must be perfect. Well, no one can be perfect in that respect. It's matter, not a matter of just thinking, but about a matter of, of, of understanding that we all fall short of the glory of God. Mark chapter 10 is a terrific text for this, and I often use this because of the implications of that for Mark chapter, rather Mark chapter 7 this wonderful and extraordinary list of, of, of things that Jesus says proceed out of us. I say wonderful and extraordinary, but it really comes down to this, this realm of uh, seeing what's inside of us, and we all fall short of that. He's talking about the human condition, what proceeds out of it. It's not a question of, of, of the, uh, the laws and so forth of what's clean or not clean, because it uh, actually comes from the evil heart thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolish. We're all nailed by that. So these are the, uh, demonstrate the need really for a heart transplant is what the whole concept is there. So if um, what's good enough to get you and what's uh, bad enough to keep you out. So if you're not perfect, anything it will do. So, but then some people think, well, maybe he forgave my past sins, but then they worry about their future sins. And I use this example here of the cross, uh, which we realize the cross of Christ, which it was actually retrospective and not just prospective. Um, that is to say, it reached back in time because the work of Christ on the cross and since there was never another uh, means of salvation, the, the basis of salvation has always been the death of Christ. God transcends the boundaries of space and time, and in his work on the cross, it retroactively goes back to the sin of the first man, and it goes to the end as well. So this is a very cri critical thing. It's not a question of the timing. In fact, how many of my sins were in the future when Jesus died? And of course, the obvious answer is all of them. It's a question of how we see where, that we're laying hold. It's not a p matter of our past, present, and future, but his... Um, work in all three. Another question or objection may relate to the question of works. And so um, don't you have to maintain it? And it's a question again, uh, salvation, if it's a gift by God's grace, you don't deserve it, then it's his power. And this is the critical thing for us to grasp here. It's really his power and not our performance that makes all the difference in the world. So understanding that one of my favorite texts is Titus 3, 4 to 7, because it's so uh, such a rich exploration of the meaning of the good news. And I'm often finding myself now using this text uh, as I sign books. Um, it's often the one I'm now using. When the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be married or heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is, shows the Trinitarian basis of salvation, 
It talks about what he's done in the past and what and the basis for it. And it's the Holy Spirit has been given to us, justified by his grace, and indeed made heirs already according to the hope of eternal life. So it's an incredibly rich text for us uh, to consider and uh, to use. Given that, let's go back then to where we were. So it's his power that maintains it. And now to him was able to keep you from stumbling, Jude 24 says, and to make us stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. It's an incredible text that invites us to see that uh, that is the work of God on our behalf. Another text we use um, in understanding that it doesn't that it's a question of his work, not ours, is uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5.21. And I've used, I, you'll, you'll find me often using this because it's so incredibly rich. Again, uh, this concept of the double imputation, that um, if I add up my thoughts, words, and deeds, they add up to that which falls short of the glory of God, which is sin. And we look at Christ's thoughts, words, and deeds, it adds up to righteousness, which conforms to the perfect standard of God. And then what we see in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf. Is that And so that first part then is that he took our sin and put it on his side of the ledger. And then this text goes on to say, in order that we might become the righteousness of God. So he now imputes his righteousness on us. So it's the very principle that condemned us, impute, imputed sin, which now saves us because these, our sin is now, uh, the sin of Adam was imputed to us, but now that sin is imputed to Christ. And now doubly, Christ imputes his righteousness to us. So it's an incredible uh, concept when we, the more you think about that. It's just uh, actually staggers the imagination when you uh, think about the implications of his power on our behalf. And so um, we consider then the nature of gifts and the nature of a gift is if it's something that can be returned, it wasn't really the thing. It's For example, if you can be adopted into the family of God and then he unadopts you uh, would be the, almost the parallel here. But if, if what you were given was eternal life, you see, uh, then if it could be given back, it wasn't eternal life. And so it's the John uh, 5, 24 text that's often used for this as well. So um, the idea, it, it's an abundant life and it's an, an eternal life. So again, the, our text in John 5, 24, just to summon it up for you, is to sh show that this this is something that is a permanent gift. And these three things, he who hears my word, um, and believes him who sent me. So to hear it and then to believe, and we know that John is meaning believe by means of uh, receives him. To, it's tantamount to receiving that gift. It's, um, it's pistuo. It's a, it's a transfer of trust. And there are three present possessions that one has. Number one, he has present possession, eternal life. If what he had is going to not be eternal, then it wasn't eternal life to begin with. He doesn't come into judgment. Um, in other words, not a judgment of condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but it's passed out of a sphere of death into the sphere of life. And so you have this very rich and, and profound text that underscores the fact that we have this gift of eternal life. So the question then is, what about feeling? And there, some people have you know, feelings, but sometimes a possible reason, may, a person may have never really trusted Christ, in some cases, another reason that perhaps there's been a grieving of the Holy Spirit, in which the Spirit doesn't provide the person with feelings of assurance, because when we're walking in disobedience, we are, uh, in fact, invited by Paul to say, check, check, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Um, so that there is this question of whether you really had it to begin with once again. But we can grieve the Spirit of God, but if we can sin with impunity, if it, if it doesn't really bother us, if we can, then I question whether you have the real thing at all. Many times, and I still remember it myself, um, the first time you, when you really come to faith, then you realize you're a lot worse than you thought you were. Then you wonder. Um, so if anything, you become aware because of the convicting work of the Spirit of God where things you could do with impunity are no longer the case. If you can do that with the same feeling, uh, then you, I question whether you have the real thing because you've been granted this new gift of a new nature in Christ, which is inimical to the way of the world and the flesh and the devil. So we have the ignorance of the biblical teaching on assurance is often the reason why people don't get it. Um, a number of texts that we won't go into right now, but I'll maybe amplify perhaps in our uh, the, the open time, is 
passages on assurances, um, and we can look at these, John 5, 24, John 10, we looked at that. So many passages that are here, and all this material is available, um, and you, you can see to you. And then we also have some other texts uh, that relate to, those are usually used to refute assurance, as in John 15, uh, 6, but he's uh, when he says he cuts them off, he's talking about uh, the works, uh, the, the the branches that are dead, and so um, we know that that that's going to be something that's going to happen. But it doesn't mean that the person himself is going to be uh, lose their salvation. The James, the the Galatians five, you've you've been uh, you you the idea you no longer uh, are into the position of faith. Galatians five uh, four. We can see that it, you're moving out from one sphere to another. And when he describes it in these terms, you have been severed from Christ. You're seeking to be justified for law. You've fallen from grace. To fall from the, but here is talking about the idea of those who have a, a, a grace orientation. It's if you are going back to the principle of justification by law, you've fallen from a principle of grace. But if we have this real group, uh, this gift, it's really ours. And so um, then the other one that's used is uh, Hebrews 5, uh, rather 6, 4 to 6. And really what it would be saying is that um, you can't go back to, you can't re re go back to the initial uh, stage of salvation. If you have it, it's a gift of yours. So you need to move on from the basic uh, things. It's a very difficult text. But, but then the James 2 text we can look at as well where he talks about works are the evidence of faith before men, and uh, whereas Paul is talking about the evidence of faith before God. So um, there's a big difference between those. So we can look at those, but those are the basic texts that are involved with these kinds of things. And so just giving you a bit, bit of an overview of that, um, just to let you know, next week then we're going to be moving on from here, and we're going to be looking at um, another text. Uh, in fact, we're going to be going back to um, one of the questions about the existence of God, and one of the one of the questions that follows from that is the question of what about evolution. So that's a follow up from the or a supplement uh, from the question of the existence of God. So I thought it would be best for me to save that for a second kind of a thing that we would do. Um, so if we, we're looking at these kinds of of, of questions. Then um, we're looking at. Um, the uh, Hebrews six. We're going to be one of the questions relates to that, and we'll look at more at that. But I just wanted to let you know, though, that we are going to be doing that next week. It's going to be at seven o'clock to eight o'clock, and that's going to be a fun session for us to explore together. So many possibilities. Um, we're going to be um, not just doing apologetics. I want to do a number of different things with you and kind of mix it up after this uh, initial series on the basic objections. But um, again, the, the thing to do is to go to Reflections Ministries channel on YouTube, um, the reflections.org uh, website, and, um, and to sign up. Us. And if you're not receiving the daily growth and daily, um, um, the, and also the monthly teaching letter, I'd encourage you to do that as you scroll down on that website. So let's take a look then at some of these questions that we have before us and um, see where we can go from here. Lord bless you.